the discomfort. Most people avoid the discomfort. They don't want to hear it. But if I get you in a place where you, through your empathy and understanding, you feel you relate to something, you're more likely to get on board, be an ally and try and make a difference. Hello and welcome to the Culture of Things podcast. I'm your host, Brendan Rogers, and today we are recording episode 66. I'm talking with Martin Stark. Martin, how are you, mate? Mate, I'm good. I'm actually a bit pumped. I had a boxing class this morning with my coach. So seven rounds we did of two minutes of sparring and then he's actually finished off. I've got really tight calves from running. So he finished off by massaging my calves to free them up a little bit. So it was a very different style of boxing class this morning, but I loved it. Sounds fascinating, mate. How long does the class go for? About 45 minutes. So yeah. I, I train in two different locations. I go to the corporate fitness center for my fight night in regular classes and I've got awesome coaches. And then I have my own uh, private coach who's got a studio in Bondi. Pretty intense 45 minutes, it sounds like. It's good. It's, it's one of those things, if you really love what you do, those 45 minutes go by really quickly. Yeah. I hated playing soccer at school. I was always the last one to be picked. So, you know, PE lessons, they lasted like 45 hours, whereas a boxing class, 45 minutes just goes by so quickly. Uh, it's always good to hear when people are doing something they love, mate, and you've uh, you found a love for boxing, which we're going to certainly unpack during the interview today. Um, but, mate, thanks for coming in and spending some time after your uh, after your class. You're a, you're a better man than me, mate, because I often run and swim with a mate each morning, but I woke up this morning, looked out the window. It was pissing down. I messaged my mate who came back, and, and I said, oh, maybe we do a, just a swim. And he comes back with one word, skip. Skip. <laughs> so we did nothing. <laughs> oh, well, what I'd like to do first of all is acknowledge the traditional owners of the land where I currently am, the Gamaraga people, paying respects to elders past, present and emerging. I'd like to extend that respect to all Aboriginal, Torres Strait Islander and First Nations people. Thank you, mate. Appreciate the uh, the welcome to country. Well done. How about no, we get welcome. it? How about we share your biography so we know a bit a bit more about you? So definitely Martin Stark, I'm a proud Australian, originally from the UK. My day job is I'm organising the world's first LGBTQ boxing competition, the World Gay Boxing Championships. I'm a keynote speaker. I talk about courage and inclusion and how people and organisations to entrench culture as a habit. Very passionate about social justice and, and making a difference. I spent 15 years working in technology procurement, negotiating big technology outsourcing contracts and dealing with a multitude of people and companies. So always having that relationship has been important in my, in my career. Mate, you've just saved me a job. I prepared you a biography. And you've just, <laughs> hey, this, that's fantastic. Look, maybe I should get the guests to do it more often. You do it far more succinctly as well. It, it's interesting because when I first started posting content on LinkedIn two and a half years ago, I started doing videos and very succinct communication is really impactful communication. There's a strategy which I use called connect and set. Connect means in order for you to really understand something, it's important to really, you, you set the scene and make sure people are ready to really hear what you want to say, what the conversation is going to be about. Once you've done that, you can really flow. And often I find what I call sales or information bombardment. People just send you so much information. Well, what are you trying to say here? Because I'm, I haven't got the, the first point. Conversations, they ebb and they flow, but set the scene and allow everybody to be captivated to listen. I really like that connect and set. So if I'm understanding correctly, that connect is really on that relationship, you know, making yeah. connections with people. How has that been beneficial for you in doing what you're, what you're trying to achieve with the World Boxing Championships, as an example, in 2023? So what really happens is just having a very strong, purposeful vision. So I say disrupting homophobia, transphobia and hatred in sport. Very simple. Most people are fundamentally against homophobia, hatred, and bigotry. It's a very simple message. But then when people ask things behind the message, 
it gives an opportunity to have have that discussion. A lot of times people fear saying the wrong thing. They fear making a mistake and, and that, that's a real shame because if I can talk about the stats of homophobia in sport, for, for example, about 80% of all people have, have actually witnessed or observed homophobia in sport. 50% of all LGBTQ plus Americans have been insulted or abused when playing, watching or talking about sport. And 90% of the LGBTQ plus community think homophobia, etc., is a problem in sport. Those stats are awful. I mean, the mm -hmm. worst thing for me is we, as a community, we participate in sport at half the rate as the wider community. Well, at least five times more likely to attempt suicide. Wow. That, if I just hit you with those stats straight away, you're going to go, but if I opened up your heart to this is what I'm doing. In your eyes, there's, there's empathy, there's, there's understanding. But if I just said ending homophobia in sport, people would, they might not take the messages the way you've just taken the message right now. So opening up somebody's mind, connecting, setting the scene to have a really engaging, impactful conversation because the discomfort, most people avoid the discomfort, they don't want to hear it. But if I get you in a place where you, through your empathy and understanding, you feel you relate to something, you're more likely to get on board, be an ally and try and make a difference. Yeah, my our, our theme of today's conversation that sort of going to permeate through is that championing courage, which is what you do and, you know, delivering courage. I know you've got something tattooed on the back of your back as well. I, I have... That. I have three words tattooed on my back. I, I'm not going to apologize. I am a bit of a diva. Mardi Gras 2018, I had blue hair and I had a word painted on my back and it was courage. And a few weeks later, I actually had that word tattooed on my back. Mardi Gras the following year, I said, what, what can go underneath courage? Fear nothing was, was painted. So then I had fear nothing tattooed underneath courage. Now, when I had the first tattoo, the, the tattooist was very cheeky. I said, you know, do you, it can be quite lovely. Do you have long to go yet? And he said, we're halfway there. <laughs> Two minutes later, he finished. So I'm just thinking this is, oh, I'm okay. It's fine. And then he just said, it, it's all finished. It's all done. Oh, well. Now you've walked straight into it, mate. Get your shirt off. Show us. We need to see oh, this. Here we go. We need we to go. see this. Do I need to talk the those that may listen to the podcast rather than watch it, do I need to talk them through the unveiling or anything like that? I Look, it's, I've uh, taken my top off before. On the, You've got so. a beautiful sort of tartan ready shirt on by the looks. Yes. Let me just take my shirt off. Uh, what am I doing? Getting on the podcast, taking my He's shirt off. He's slowly but surely pulling his shirt. Look at that. Courage right in the back, right in the centre. And what were the words underneath? No fear? Fear nothing. Fear nothing. That is fantastic, mate. Have you ever got your shirt off for a podcast before? Uh, no, I don't think I have. This is the first for me. Awesome. I, I used to do a LinkedIn live show, and I think one time a friend and I, I did 1,500 push-ups, and she was doing boxing, and we were talking about silly things. We were having a conversation like this, but we just wanted to bring some lighthearted humor, and somebody challenged me to do 1,000 push-ups in an hour, and I'd end up doing 1,500. And she was hitting a punching bag. So, you know, it's it's a platform for professional conversations, but it doesn't mean you can't have fun at the same time. Mate, it's it's all about just being vulnerable and we, we're just people at the end of the day, right? So what I'm really fascinated by, I mean, you know, having something like that on your body is, is one thing, but what where is that moment in time that you can look back on? What's given you this courage and this element of fear, nothing? Where did that start? I've I've always had it. But I had a fear of not meeting my own standard, that, that classic perfectionist. In a performance review in 2016, end, end of 2015 or beginning of 2016, I was getting high achiever. Every year I was getting high achiever. Manager said, Martin, to be more courageous. It just I read that. And people were saying that. I said, why am I holding myself back? So I just embraced it, did it. The following year, my performance review said has gone from taking direction to giving direction. 
I've negotiated the biggest outsourcing deal of a major bank, won all of these awards for, for doing things, but it, it was that difference. But I've come through great adversity through health. I've been in two induced comas. I've had a tracheot. The tracheotomy was always my worst fear. So in 2006, I had gallstones blocking my liver. I have a rare water immune condition, Addison's disease. I have a procedure called an ERCP to try and remove a blockage in my bile duct. Dye seeped into my pancreas. Within 12 hours, I have severe acute pancreatitis. My lungs are collapsed. I remember going for a CT scan. I was in intensive care. I remember going for a CT scan. I'm not religious, but I was praying to God to get me back to the intensive care because I, I was struggling to breathe. And I thought, what if I go into cardiac arrest when I'm in a CT, having a CT scan? It's going to be hard. I don't know why that entered my mind. But getting back to intensive care meant at least the medical professionals were there. And I remember the consultant saying, I'm saying you need to put me on a ventilator, sitting next to my mum as I'm struggling to breathe. Am I going to wake up? Then coming, weakening in one coma, then I'm kind of recovering slightly, but my body is producing sepsis and probably have another adrenal crisis. And I remember the doctor, the surgeon coming over, I've been taking off some, something was taken off my mouth, probably part of the ventilator. Then I'm immobilized and they perform a tracheotomy. I remember I was sedated, but slightly aware. So I, I feel the pressure in my neck. I can't move. They're doing lots of different things. But what I noticed was the, what I described as the courage of the people around me. Well, I was close to death pretty close to death at that time. It was the final thing they could do before really saving my life. And then I'm placed in a second induced coma. Mm -hmm. So imagine living through your worst fear. Am I going to die? I can't breathe. Having a tracheotomy. And then the next thing, and I talk about the dreams I experienced when I was in my induced comas and the dreams in the second coma were much worse. And then waking up, not knowing you had a tracheotomy, not being able to speak. This is my natural voice using my normal, the way you would speak. So I had to learn how to speak through my diagram to get my, my voice back. That, that experience was just one of, of other terrible health experiences I had to go through. A few weeks later, I was transferred to a major hospital and I was told I had a 50-50 chance of having bile duct cancer. So for 36 hours, I'm thinking what's going to happen. And the next day I had an MRI scan. In my mind, I'd already decided that if it was a, an aggressive form of cancer, there's nothing they could do. For me, I was more focused on the quality of life. I don't want any chemotherapy. I don't want anything to, I don't want suffering to prolong. You know, luckily it wasn't. A few months later having major surgery, the surgery goes well, but my wound site gets infected. So I'm back in hospital again, wound is opened up, cleaned, for four months, my wound site is packed daily. Then I'm back in hospital, back in hospital, back in hospital, I'm like the fourth admission, and then diagnosed with Addison's disease, a rare autoimmune condition. So what can I do about this? I can't change any of this. I can accept it. I can educate myself. And through that, I'm empowered to then make the, the choices I have. I'll, within my control. I can't change the past. I can't change having Addison's disease. I can't change the nightmares and PTSD I have from the dreams of being in a coma. I can't change any of that, but I can accept it. And I can try and live life to the max. Mate, thanks for sharing the story. I was sort of aware of some of that, but have you reflected back and thought, well, it's just such a common scenario where people have had, you know, an experience or different experiences, but a real life changing experience like that, like that for us to be more courageous. Like what, what was stopping you before a moment like that in living your life to the fullest and, and really championing courage? I think it was that perfectionism and just seeking that approval. I, I used to describe it, it, it was part-time confidence. When I did something well, I excelled, I was great. But other times if I didn't meet my own standard, already I'm punishing myself and any conversations. I'm really 
seeking approval from others to be confident again. And, but you see other people would make a mistake and you say, no problem. You know, we all learn from that, but it just took further time to get there. And you, people don't always know that they're achieving because how often are you put down or you're doing something and somebody will say something, not because they actually mean something good for you because masking their own insecurities. It's much easier to say to somebody, oh, you shouldn't be doing that. Why are you saying that rather than great? You go forward. I always want people to have the best opportunities in life, but if you're unhappy or you're insecure and you see somebody achieving, you can put your own self-worth first and put the other person down. And that's what I think happens a lot in society. Mm. Can you give us some context, mate, to your experience around, okay, you're openly gay and I think you came out in your, in your late 20s or mid-20s yeah. for memory. What was life like for you sort of, I guess, living with that, coping with that before coming out, can I say? So going back to the 1980s, it was a very, very different time. So I probably realized I was gay around 11 or 12. It was fear of being coming out, people thinking in 1987, 1988, the UK government enacted a law called Section 28, which was against the promotion of homosexuality by local authorities. In the late eighties, the UK's biggest soap opera EastEnders, they had two gay characters. One of them, there's another, there's the peck on the cheek. It was national outrage. It was not, it was the sun or the, how dare these things happen. So it was a very, very different time. So imagine being a gay kid, teenager, are you going to speak out or say anything? It, Cause it was just absolutely entrenched hatred in, in the media and in, in the law. The only visible representation were people like boy George or a few others, but there was, there was absolutely nothing in 1993 or 1994, the UK government only lowered the age of consent for gay men from 21 to 18. So really as a teenager, you think oh, it's until I can't be who I want to be until at least I'm the age of 21. And it's, it, it was a very, very different environment, but my parents have always been loving family have always been loving. So I had nothing to fear from that, but it's, it's often what society permeates and, and we didn't even use the term homophobia then, you know, it was gay bashing was, was commonplace, but nobody would, would report it. The police in New South Wales have just published a report saying they're going to look into all of the gay hate crimes. And I think it was widely believed that gay men were hunted for sport in Sydney in the latter part of the 20th century, people were thrown off cliffs, nothing was done about it. So when there's indifference to people being murdered when there's indifference to people being victims of crime in that eighties, nine, well, certainly the eighties period, you think what it must be like as a gay teenager, things mm. are very different, but that, that fear really permits to think you have to get to a stage where you feel comfortable. Yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing, fascinating and, and extremely disappointing to, to hear those things. Not that I'm naive to know, to think that they didn't happen, but what is it that has changed for the good since those times? Like the, the things that stick out to you, that's really enhanced the um, gay movement. So that for, I say for the LGBTQI plus movement, that, that there's been wider acceptance in, in society. Think about laws which have changed. Think about Section 28 was repealed, the anti-discrimination laws, marriage equality. We've also seen more visibility and representation of LGBTQ plus people and also LGBTQ plus people of colour. There's been more support from the community, from corporations. We have employer resource groups now. We have something called the Australian Workplace Equality Index, which is run by Pride in Diversity and actually measures companies and, and how inclusive they are. So there's been more wider acceptance. People are coming out earlier, you know, laws have changed. And I, I talk about allies. Were it not for allies, 
we wouldn't have marriage equality in Australia because of, of that postal plebiscite, whatever it was called. Things have changed, hearts and minds have changed. But at the same time, we're in the era of social media, we've given a platform for homophobia, for racism, for transphobia, in the form of communication, which was really never there, you know, even at the beginning of, of, of this century. So the actual incidence of, of things is, is probably still increasing, certainly on social media, certainly in sport, that there's, there's more work to be done. There's often think people think, what next? Well, it's not what next, it's actually just stopping people being homophobic. It's stopping people being racist. I'm sick to death of talking about it, but I'm talking about it because if I don't, who, who doesn't? Is it up to the victims to solve the problems of racism? No, as a white man who's married to a black man, it is in my interest to do that because I want my husband to have the same rights and privileges as everybody else. I, as a white man, if I say something against somebody who's making a racist comment, it means my husband who may be experiencing that racism, if I say something, it stops him from having to say something. So we really need to, to move the dial on advocacy and not create an environment where people should have to experience discrimination. So what is it that we, you've spoken about, obviously given some context to what it was like previously and some things that have changed for the better, what do we still need to do? Again, I'm conscious of using that what's next, but what, where do we need to progress in this next, say, five, 10 years for you? In the next five, 10 years, I am concerned with the level of media focus on trans and non-binary people. It's nearly every single day there is something. And I just don't get this. I don't know why. I think transphobia is where homophobia was 15 years ago, but in, in the age of, of social media. Last Saturday was Transgender Day of Remembrance. There's one report that says 375 trans, non-binary, gender non-conforming people have been murdered in the world in the last 12 months. That figure is probably much higher. So it's actually an increase from, from the previous year. Black and trans people of colour are disproportionately affected by that. What we need to advance is also the, the, the fear of people being who they are. The younger generation, they're so accepting. They're really passionate about making a difference. We're talking about a, a positive social impact. Let's stop homophobia. Let's stop having more allies, wearing a, a rainbow lanyard, wearing a, a pin, more allies speaking up so that I don't have to say something, you say something. People spending five minutes educating themselves and reading what LGBTQ plus may mean or what some of the issues are. So that really, if somebody said something homophobic or racist, you would say, you know what, mate, this, this is the impact and that's just not, not acceptable. Whereas when somebody says nothing, if it's up to me to say something, mate, I find that offensive. Well, the, the greatest things at the moment are saying you're just being woke or it's cancel culture. When has it ever been woke to actually say racism is wrong, misogyny is wrong, homophobia is wrong? When has it ever been cancel culture to say, you know what, if you make a racist remark, a homophobic remark, it's offensive, I don't like it. This is the impact it has. And, I, and I'm concerned with the, the polarization of things. And I talk about changing hearts and minds. You know, be a good friend, be a mate. Do all, do all of the things that friends and family do for each other, they support each other. You've used that word homophobia a number of times already what to help us understand everybody to understand better what is that i guess there's some extreme levels but maybe even what's the the subtler versions of homophobia that you may have experienced or seen so for me homophobia is like that the, the, the microaggressions so for me often if something has been very overt if somebody's going to call me a poof or a faggot you know you I'm not going to react to that. I may do if it's physically safe for me to do so. But it, it's all of those, those subtle things. Oh, you, you have a husband. A they need to know that you're a I, boxer. Absolutely, you're they a do. Boxer to do. Well. I, I, will, I, I will use my things. I will block and I walk away. But, it, but, it, but, it, but it's, it's, it's the subtle things. Oh, you have a husband, do you? 
making mocking somebody who displays their pronouns it's somebody who makes a homophobic comment and you 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 don't say something in the uk this week they've got the rainbow laces campaign which is trying to encourage people to wear rainbow laces when they're playing soccer and football and another sport and it's a it's a campaign to really stop and end homophobia transphobia in sport i think it's the brighton team in the uk you know that they go away and, and some of the opposing team fans just start chanting uh, chanting rent boy so if somebody chants a racist comment would you say something or would, would you report it if you heard a homophobic comment would you just laugh if i said i don't like it am i just being woke it's just banter all of those things I'm not sure if you watched azim rafiq last week in being interviewed by the uk parliamentary inquiry he's raised big issues about racism in cricket in the yorkshire county cricket club there was a a report nobody was disciplined you know there's been institutional racism the yorkshire county cricket club we were talking about institutional racism 20 plus years ago why does it still take the victims of something to do something about it why isn't it the the culture within the club that if somebody says something offensive if he says something says something racist that somebody doesn't pick him say hey mate stop saying that what does a heterosexual white person like me need to do to actually make a difference why I ask that, mate, is that my humble opinion is there's a lot of a virtual signaling around lots of yeah. things in our society, but I, I want you to help me understand what do I do to actually make a difference and not just virtue signal. I'm not saying I'm virtual. Hopefully I no, don't, I, don't I want to make a difference. Just the fact that you're a heterosexual white male means that you're a human being. You have experiences. You're a friend. You're a mate, do all of those things. A couple of things you could do, you might just go and Google search, just spend, spend five minutes understanding what some of the key issues are and amplify some of those key messages. You might come along to a pride parade or a Mardi Gras parade. When you hear something, say something. When you're speaking with your friends, you know, speak about these issues. If, if your friend says something, say, hey, this, this is the actual reason why they're saying this. Come along. Don't be afraid of making a mistake. Start from a place of inclusion. Thinking about some of the things that you haven't had to go through. Or some, there's a transferring privilege, which is, is a term I really love. So as a white man, I've never had to change my name. When, for when I'm applying for a job. So I've never watched Game of Thrones or Iron Man. So imagine if Tony Stark was real, he was my uncle, he's worth $9 billion. And if Game of Thrones, so the Windsors were the Stark. So I could call my uncle Harry, Prince Harry. I could call the quick, she's my, all of those privileges that I would have. But imagine I then had to change my name to apply for a job. Well, that's nonsense. But then you're, when you're screening applications, leave bias at the door. Just look for people for who they are, their skills and their capabilities. Look at things where you've had an opportunity. You look at somebody else, they haven't had that opportunity. What can you do? How can you open the door for somebody? Who can you introduce them to? What conversations can you have? How can you raise an issue about bias in recruitment or making sure that when people apply for their job, it does not matter who their, what their surname is, they have the same chances as everybody else. Speaking up is probably one of the best things you can do because the hardest thing is when the issues aren't spoken about or you fear saying something, nothing changes. As you're explaining that, there's this YouTube video that keeps coming to my head, which I've got to share. And it's just this guy and he's just dancing extremely weirdly by himself in this field of you know, a concert. And slowly but surely, the 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 motto and, and the theory of the video is around leadership and taking that, that first step. And all of a sudden, slowly but surely, you see a person who sort of, you know, goes up and, and just starts sort of slowly moving next to 
this guy who's still dancing really, you know, what yeah. we'd say weirdly or whatever. Yeah. Slowly but surely the momentum of that change and, and people get, and it's, it's that sort of Malcolm Gladwell tipping point where all of a sudden like people were running from the other side of the hill to join this, you know, congregation, which was yeah. started by one single man. Um, yeah, who am I say to, to dance weirdly or not? But yeah, he was dancing differently. But the momentum that it was, I just love the power of that. And to me, that that's you. Yeah, you know, you're that, you know, I'm not saying this disrespectfully, you're that weird guy who's dancing there and you're bringing some momentum. How is, what what people have you got around you already that is, that have you know, attracted yourself to, to your weird style of dancing, oh. can I say? <laughs> I never set out to do any of this, and that's the beauty <laughs> of the experience. I have all awesome the best allies. things start like that. It's best thing. I would say the boxing family first of all. Certainly in Australia, boxing Australia, boxing New South Wales. People who I train with, people who supported me. I have an awesome board. Four amazing people who highly skilled professionals in their own field came on board to help make a difference. I've made great connections with the LGBTQ plus community globally. We have a great LGBTQ boxing community. I have some great allies in the business community, join forums, networking events. Wow. So many people. I, it's, it's, I have just used my PC and my phone to communicate, but I've done it relentlessly. You know, I've got statements from the president of the World Boxing Council, the president of the World Boxing Association, from the International Boxing Association, a statement from the World Boxing Organization. I asked for those, you know, some, some took longer than others, but I just reached out to have those conversations. The hard thing is when you go out and share your message is you don't know who you're impacting. There's a young, LGBTQ boxer in Sri Lanka who wants to participate in the championships in, in future years. A friend of mine heard about him and said, I'm going to send him some boxing gear. So the, this LGBTQ plus boxer just bought his first pair of boxing gloves. Now I've asked his, the, the LGBTQ boxer in Sri Lanka, I've asked him, can I actually talk about the individual? The response was yes, but I, I will never name who this person is. That person is not comfortable, but the impact is having one conversation with a very close boxing friend who heard about this and said, wait a minute, I've got some wraps. I've got some bits that I can send this individual. So I imagine somebody has got the first pair of boxing gloves, really passionate, wants to be just who this person is, but an ally said, let me help him. What that's, sort of motive? Sorry, go on. That's the real impact. Absolutely. How does that make you feel? What sort of motivation does that give you to know you're having that sort of difference? <sighs> that most people are, there's an abundance of kindness. There's an abundance of compassion. When you see, hey, look for kindness in that most people are so decent hearted. Not everybody can express that in ways they feel comfortable or yet feel comfortable. Some people there's so many different ways you, you can help. So just sending boxing wraps and boxing gear to somebody in another part of the world who's just started on their boxing journey. That's the change that I want to see. Such a brilliant story. Why boxing? How did boxing come about? At the end of 2017, I almost died. I had, I'm probably in hospital about 70 times over the last 15, 16 years. I had an understanding crisis so severe in emergency, you will hear resus, which is the resuscitation section. It's really like you've been in a car crash and you're, you're close to death. That's where it will take you straight away. So it was the first time I've ever been taken into the resus. I wasn't resuscitated, but I was straight into resus. I almost died. My pulse was below 40. They saved my life. Royal North Shore Hospital is absolutely amazing. When I'm there, I give myself an intramuscular injection, the paramedics are doing all the right things, but I'm close to death again. So I know what's when I'm in the, in the recess bay, what's next is 
probably going back in an induced coma if they can't stabilize me and they do stabilize me but that brought back the memories of being in the induced coma so, was, so often we connect memories so i'm kind of back in a a very strong ptsd moment so i have a few self-defense classes at the local martial arts center the second class just happens to be boxing i was always boxing was almost barbaric it was not something i would ever consider but suddenly i'm like i'm enjoying this i can actually do this and i continue having lessons and i catalog my journey on instagram the gay boxing hashtag has less than 1000 posts with boxing has got 20 million so i just continue 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 decided I want to go to the gay games in 2022. I was calling myself the future world gay boxing champion. I want to win gold for Australia. Then find out it's no longer a list of sport. And I understand that because there are only so many sports and I actually have an Addisonian crisis and I'm in hospital attached to a drip. And I go, why don't I go and create the world's first gay boxing championships? And one of those crazy ideas that seems to catch on. Who does that? Like, who? where does that come from? Have you ever thought about that? You know, you, you reference your parents before and loving parents and upbringing and stuff, but there's that stuff, that substance in people. Not everyone just sort of wakes up or has a moment like that and, you know what, I'm just going to do my own thing. I'm going to create it myself. What's that driver there? I think I've always, as I was talking earlier about courage, you know, holding myself back, but I've seen what's possible. You know, the Gay Games has been going for 40 years. A few people started that. I've seen what has happened in international sport and LGBTQ plus sport. So I know what's possible. I know what can be achieved. So when I see a vision, I can see this is, this, this can be done. So I just reach out there and see, let, let's make this happen and start building relationships with people with that succinct communication, with that connect and set way of communicating, you get people on board, you, you build relationships. Then you get to the position where you have those relationships and it's much easier to plan my background in, in procurement source things from, you know, great relationship with boxing, Australia, boxing, New South Wales, they have programs, referees, judges, we do things pursuant to their rules. Imagine trying to write boxing rules for something that's never happened before. I'd still be writing them two years later, but these events already exist. It's just about connecting people with people to get LGBTQ plus people in our allies in a boxing competition. Are the establish, establishments doing enough, in your opinion? As you said, and I've seen the letters on the website and the letters of support, fantastic. Again, what, are they doing enough to progress, um, you know, where we need it to go? No. Some are, some aren't. I will, I'm going to say within this country, I've been impressed with boxing and the leadership and the engagement. I think we've seen great progress, certainly with rugby union in this country. It's been great to see the, the Bingham Cup held in Australia in 2014. I think some sports at the leadership level, they're only just starting that journey with racism is in cricket. To be honest, cricket has not taken racism seriously enough in the UK for that to be even resolved as an issue. What I have seen a change this year is in visible allyship. Sebastian Vettel wore a rainbow face mask, rainbow helmet, rainbow shirt in the Hungarian Grand Prix. We've seen Austin Martin have a rainbow flag in a Formula One car. We've seen Lewis Hamilton wear rainbow sneakers at the Hungarian Grand Prix. Hungary is enacting some anti-LGBTQ plus laws. The other week, Lewis Hamilton wore the rainbow flag on his helmet in Qatar. In Euro 2020, we saw the England and German captain wear rainbow armbands in that match. So we've seen great visible allyship. But I always talk about the real changes at that grassroots amateur level. And that's where I think sport in general needs to be investing more within the grassroots, supporting people, getting clubs, getting more of those things, especially after COVID, 
get more funding into the grassroots and that if you can really impart the messages of inclusion, not just for LGBTQ plus people, but for all marginalized or underrepresented communities. If you think about 2005 in Cronulla, what happened afterwards was the local lifeguards, they were inviting people from the Muslim community to train to be lifeguards. People who weren't included, why they're not included. It might not be an exclusive, but start from how you can include other people. I, I read a story a few months ago, how there was a, a swimming class for people who'd never been able to have the opportunity to swim. Now, swimming is a life, life skill. Earlier this year, a swimming cap was banned from the Olympics. Swimming caps, when I was swimming, it was like one size fits all. And I remember some of my female swimming friends spending hours trying to get all the hair scrunched up. Now, if you think for, like for black women who might have more voluminous hair, a swimming cap is important. So there's a, a company created a swimming cap, which enabled people with, with different hair to have a swimming cap and get in the pool. Now imagine the difference is you, a swimming cap, you can go and swim. But for the Olympic Games, this swimming cap was banned because it, according to the rules, it gave an advantage. Yet, I don't know about swimming in Australia, but in the UK, uh, the Amateur Swimming Association or British Women, they said, we're not against that. This swimming cap can be used for all competitions in swimming in the UK. So FINA, the governing body, banned it, whereas the British swimming body said, no, we, we like this. We, we want people to be able to use this cap in swimming. You see the difference. There's a structure of these are the rules, which may not contemplate people of different backgrounds and just somebody's hair, for goodness sake. If you have bigger hair, you, you not need a swimming cap, which suits your hair rather than something like me or you, a, a standard swimming cap will be probably fine. But the rules means this cap can't be used because it's a distinct advantage. So that means this cap is banned. That swimming cap can be used by people who may not be able to swim, to learn to swim. What skills are you using that you developed over time to help align the various levels of the boxing community? We'll focus on that because obviously that's, that's where you're at. What, what are you doing and what do you need to do in the future so to get that alignment? Yeah. The skills really are my strong communication skills, relationship management skills, working in procurement, negotiating big technology outsourcing agreements, dealing with the C-suite, dealing with CEOs of software companies, bringing all of those things together. Also using my corporate skills, writing strategies, business cases, grant applications, marketing, all, all of those things. If you don't have that, it's great to have people who can help you with that. Those are the skills that I've been using. But I think the, the biggest skill is just opening up the conversation, allowing people to feel they're comfortable to make a mistake, being courageous, starting this conversation so that people can say, yes, I'm on board or I agree with it. What's this about? Creating an environment where people can feel included and have a conversation. A classic example is some friends who didn't know what LGBTQ plus men have been able to ask questions about trans people, non-binary people. They're now allies and they're able to have that conversation with some of their network. So when somebody doesn't understand something, I've been able to spend five or 10 minutes and these awesome allies and advocates, when people ask about the World Gay Boxing Championships, they're mentioning some of the stats I mentioned earlier, but they're communicating the why and they're communicating what something means. So you mentioned the LGBTQI plus for all of us. What, what does that really mean? So L, lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans. Trans is also a, an umbrella term. There's trans, transgender, some people may change their gender. They, but, but some people are transgender non-conforming. They may not decide to go through the transition. They may just decide to represent who they are, their gender direct, their gender identity may not match with their sex assigned at birth. So they may have been born male, but they are female. So use the pronoun she, her. One of my very close friends, Celia Daniels, 
she's a trans lady and she has decided she doesn't want to do the, the, the transition hormone treatment any surgery she applied for a job using her male name went for the interview as celia dressed as celia and was basically they were surprised offered a job much lower level than the job celia applied for using her male name q is queer um queer is a, a bit of an umbrella term for people within the lgbtqi plus community personally i remember when queer was used as a derogatory term certainly in the 80s and 90s i don't describe myself as queer i is for intersex and then the plus is for other there's, there's pansexual there's, there are a lot of things which i or to be honest struggle with but it's by having the plus it's 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 being inclusive mm. it's always made it's important that we understand make it simple to understand to have the conversation you, you and i are, are similar ages actually yeah. and i agree with you like that term queer which just stands out to me that was used derogatory so are you telling me now that that's you know that's something we need it's, it's a proud term so I would say it's a term which has been embraced and take and the ownership has t been taken back back by the community and for younger people will probably describe themselves as queer they will they might not say they're gay they may just say they're queer and they said they're lesbian they said they're queer and they said they're bisexual and so they're queer so I think it's become a bit of a of an umbrella term I think it's a good way of somebody identifying who they are without having to explain something more than they don't feel comfortable with Personally, I don't describe myself as queer. I just say I'm gay. I'm a gay man, member of the LGBTQ plus community. But I love the word has gone from an insult into a world which has been owned and embraced by the community. Mm. Just thinking, mate, my wife uses the term weirdo for me. Does your <laughs> husband call you a weirdo? <laughs> no, plenty of things, but <laughs> usually causing trouble or my cleaning, you know, I've missed the corner. And my favorite These was... supposed loved ones have all sorts of uh, supposedly affectionate terms for us, don't they? <laughs> <laughs> my favourite thing last year was hallway vacuuming and always going in straight lines, missing the corners. <laughs> But I have to say, we bought a fantastic new Hoover last weekend, and I love it. It is so it's it's making the carpet super clean, mate. You have to get one if you're struggling. <laughs> oh, classic! You you referred to pronouns, yeah. And I, I do come from a bit of a naive place as far as this goes. Can you please help me understand what is the the value and what is really the importance of the pronoun situation? This is really about providing an environment where people feel comfortable to express who they are. Some stats that I'm reading is that about 25% of younger people are identifying as non-binary. So their, their sex assigned at birth may not align with their gender identity. They may decide as non-binary. So I will display my pronouns as he, him, just to provide an environment where somebody who may not feel comfortable explaining that they're non-binary, they're trans. If I put he, him in my email, if I put it when I'm on a Zoom call, then the person could say, my pronouns are they, them. And it just creates an environment where they can just be who they are. As a gay man in a closet, the hardest thing was hiding. We come out every single day. But imagine going into a meeting, you see somebody who's displaying the pronouns or doing that and somebody could say, well, I'm, I'm trans and my pronouns are she, her, you've taken away so much angst and replaced that with an environment of confidence and where people can just be who they are without apology, without hiding. What value do pronouns have for me? I think pronouns are also part of your, your identity. So I'm a proud gay male, so I use he, him. Pronouns, somebody might ask, you know, what, what pronouns do you use? We say, I'm Brendan and I use he, him. Another person, trans person, I'm, I'm going to use she, her, because by using she, her, she's able to confidently be herself 
and be respected by other individuals. A non-binary person may use they, them. By you using, expressing your pronouns, you're creating an environment where they feel comfortable to express who they are. But imagine the opposite. Imagine you're trans female and you're constantly being called sir, referred to as he, being called a bloke. Imagine how cruel that is on your character, your identity, who you are. And that person just keeps doing it. Whereas you're in a meeting and you just display your pronoun. So that person is, is, is less likely to do that because you've created an environment where people can be comfortable. We talk about psychological safety. Now, psychological safety is so important. As I mentioned that the stats of self-harm and suicide are incredibly high within the LGBTQI plus community, particularly young LGBTQI plus people. But the difference where they don't have to hide who they are, I, I, for me, I suppose today's world would be much easier when it would come out at school because now there are, you know, so, there's so much more support in place for, for young people. Imagine if I don't have to talk about pronouns where the teacher might just say my pronouns are he, him, she, her, they, them. It's not even a conversation. It's just respect. It's just kindness. It's courtesy. It's dignity. And, and what you've explained makes a lot of sense to me. Again, putting yourself in the other person's shoes, you know, that, that empathetic approach, it absolutely perfectly sensible um, and very respectful. I, I respect people that do that and I have personally have no challenge or no issue with that and I really appreciate you explaining that to me to help me have gain a better understanding where I where I feel less comfortable is that I, I'm not a person within the LGBTIQ community I want to continue to have an understanding of that but I don't understand what I still don't understand what value I can provide and like why would I use pronouns when I, I don't I don't need to, like I am who I am. I'm, I'm not sort of okay, so what you explained. By you using your pronouns, the synonym or signature means I can be myself around you, means you're an ally, you're, you're doing visible allyship. Okay, so this is where the how you define ally yeah. comes in. Yeah, it's about advocacy, it's about creating that environment. And you don't have to, I mean, you don't, but it's, it's about just being a, a good mate a good friend, especially for the younger generation coming through, who are so aware, who are more confident to express who they are. Can you imagine going to school, coming out and having all of your peer group accept you and support you versus having to fear that? Or you leave university, there are some studies show that an LGBTQ plus student will be out at university, but they'll get back into the closet in the workplace. Imagine you go into where you start your first, first job and the few people who are allies just use the pronouns in their email signature or on a Zoom call. Then you felt, I'm a non-binary person. I'm just going to discreetly add they them to my email signature. I don't need to even ask the question. I'm, I'm going to start doing that now. And when I go into a meeting, I don't have to explain what non-binary means when I'm using these pronouns. It's just respect. It's just courtesy. It's just accepted. There's no, it's not even a discussion item because there's that visible support and I'm accepted for who I am and I can contribute to the fullest or if I'm having to hide who I am or hide part of me, I'm constantly having to explain why I'm using these pronouns and what that means. You as an ally, you can spend five minutes reading something. You can spend a couple of minutes understanding something. And if you can act what you've learned, why, why wouldn't you? It's not compelling, but why, why wouldn't you? Mate, thank you very much for explaining that. I reason why I wanted to unpack that because I don't have any confirmed statistics on this at all, but I certainly sense that the majority of people that would be using pronouns, whether that's LinkedIn or whatever, 
have no idea what you've just explained. I agree. I agree. And so I look forward to making sure we share this widely through this conversation where people can make a, an educated decision and not just jump on a bandwagon because yeah. if they're educated about stuff which is something you're driving hard to do and being courageous with change, then it means something and people will do something about it. It comes about just being respectful. It's just from a, a place of inclusion. Mm. My concern is when, you know, it's, oh, this is woke, this is cancel culture, all of those things. I don't know what any of those words or those terms mean now, because if you say you're a, you don't like something, your class has been a snowflake, you're too sensitive. I mean, the right to free speech, when has the right to free speech never included the right to reply or say, you know what, I don't like what you're saying. I only like what you're saying if it agrees with me. Um, absolutely. <laughs> if, if not, I'm going to call you all the words under the sun. And if you say something, you're cancelling me. Or We've got to stop that nonsense and just start being respectful, being inclusive and saying, spending five minutes researching something and then maybe asking somebody a question. We've had a very respectful conversation. I haven't felt uncomfortable in any of it. Doubling down on this courage, you referred earlier about coming out. I guess it's a common term in the LGBTIQ community, I imagine. Can you give us some understanding for us around your coming out? What involved in that and the emotions wrapped up in that before and, and after and all that sort of stuff? Give us some context. So my coming out, I was 27 and I published it in it about four or five years earlier. I think coming out is always an individual's journey and it's about accepting who you are first of all. So often you might start from a place of fear. Am I going to be accepted here? Am I going to hear jokes, you know, gay jokes, gay comments, all of those bits. If I say I'm gay, am I going to be rejected? If I tell, when I tell you I'm gay, does that mean now you're going to hate me? You're not going to listen to me. You're, you're going to shun me. Am I just then a focus of ridicule? Am I going to be discriminated against if, if I apply for a job, if I apply for a promotion? Does that mean because I'm gay, you don't want gays around, so you're going to do all, all of those things? I came to the town, I just needed to live life for me. I can remember telling my oldest brother first and said, you know, other brother, we know, parents. It was a non-issue. And the rest of the family, it, just, it wasn't an issue, but it was always like a, a place of fear to then to the point where no, I don't need to live my life for me. Not everybody has that environment and support structure. So it's always a, a different journey for different people. And it's, I always think come out on your own terms. You know, please, whenever you feel comfortable, it's what you decide to do. Have a support mechanism in place. I got to the stage where like, am I going to live my life for me? I'm living in Sydney. This is what I, who I am. Why am I stopping? And it was just, yeah, had that courage to do it and just did it. But it's, it's a moment I feared for, for many, many years. So what was that feeling like once that cloak was dropped? Can I say? I think when I told my oldest brother, it was just acceptance straight away. It was just much easier. You know, it was like, oh, okay, okay. Just that, that immense relief. It wasn't that, duh, I know. Oh, absolutely it was. He just said, no, first he said, I know, we've known for years. We've just been waiting for you to tell us. You know, it's one of those conversations. It makes no difference. It wasn't one of those moments. One one. Can I just, sorry to interrupt there, can I just say that that's another thing that fascinates me in that when we talk around leadership and we talk about genuine conversations, like what was stopping your brother or your family coming to you and say, hey, Martin, are you gay? I think. Why was the pressure on you? And that's the thing. Often I think it's, it's better to actually through language and conversation be welcoming and accepting in what you're saying. And I probably, those messages were probably been told for me for years and years, but there was respect for me. It's up for me as an individual when I'm ready versus just 
outing somebody. I mean, outing was something which was done in, in the last century, you know, where the press would say this person is gay and that their lives were radically changed. But for, for, I think it was just around, around respect for me and making sure I'm comfortable first, but they created a culture that I could go and have that conversation. That support mechanism was in place. It was up for me to then just to, to take those steps. Mm. Walk through the door. Walk through the door. I mean, a few years ago, I, I was mentioned having blue hair from Mardi Gras. I remember being at a, a location of work. Getting I in... have to say, I am very disappointed that you haven't donned the blue hair today. You, um... you wait till it goes yellow in two weeks in my fire. <laughs> <laughs> but I, arriving at work early, sharing the lift with two other people, and I was getting those looks of disapproval, you know, those, those microaggressions. And, you know, oh, look at this guy, he's got. Blue hair. And then I happened to mention, oh, Mardi Gras this weekend. And their faces change, big smiles and everything. So at one point, you're getting those looks of being judged. Why am I having blue hair at work? To suddenly difference. There was that acceptance of those individuals. But why, what their reactions didn't bother me in the slightest. But why did it take to me to say it's Mardi Gras this weekend for them to be smiling and accepting versus other people would, you know, would come and ask me what are you doing for Mardi Gras this weekend, love what you're doing, see the difference where I'm accepted and supported versus getting in a lift with those looks of disapproval, looks of shock. And I think allies turn that around beautifully. Yeah, I like to say it's always trying to come from a place of curiosity yeah. as opposed of judgment, isn't it? Yeah. Mm. Mate, we haven't spoken a lot about the Gay Boxing Championships in 2023. Here's your chance to spruik a little bit about <laughs> what's happening and all the work you're putting in and, and the momentum you're gathering around that. So from the 18th to the 22nd of February 2023, we're going to have a five-day amateur boxing competition at the Wink Stand at the Australian Turf Club in Randwick. So we are planning for having a maximum of 200 participants. So it's open to the LGBTQIA plus and allies. So we've engaged heavily with our boxing friends here in Australia. So our competition is based on three by two minute rounds, amateur competition with participants matched on their age and experience. IEBA, which is the governing body for amateur boxing globally, have announced 13 new weight divisions. So what we've done is we've selected six of those weight divisions. So for example, it could be like 57 to 60, 63 to 66 kilos. So we're going to offer six weight divisions, amateur boxing competition, knockout style. Over five days, we've got support from World Pride, from Mardi Gras in terms of letter of support. Clovermore, love her. She gave us a beautiful letter of support early in the year. This is for me giving, giving back. The first politician I met was James Griffin, who's a state MP for Manly. And I'd met him at a few events previously. And he said, as soon as you're ready, come and have a conversation with me. So contacted James Griffin's office, had a meeting a week or so later, and he gave us our first letter of support and helped introduce us to a few other people. Same with Zali Stegel, who's our my local MP. She gave us a statement of support and Alex Greenwich is a state MP for Sydney. So we've had wonderful support from government MPs. And that's what I've really loved the most is just having that support, having the support of Boxing Australia, Boxing New South Wales, and building a global LGBTQ boxing family. A lot of it already existed. There are clubs all over the world. One of our ambassadors in the UK is a guy called Danny Baker. Danny was born Sarah, trans male. He's just been interviewed by Men's Health magazine. They did a whole photo shoot of Danny and he's going back out to Fuerteventura to train at MTK Global. Well, MTK Global is obviously one of the big boxing promoters and one of the people who's trained him is trained, uh, I think he trained alongside Anthony Joshua and Tyson Fury. <laughs> So there's some great love within the boxing family. Sounds absolutely awesome, mate. Moving ahead. So 
that event's taken place, you know, get some time to rest or whatever. What's that one thing that reflecting on an event like that, that you hope to achieve? What I hope to achieve is to really start disrupting homophobia, transphobia through inclusion and participation, because if you wait to permission or if you wait to be invited, why is that holding you back? We can replace hatred by seeing people in the ring, people feeling comfortable that can go to a local boxing class. We can grow boxing. So for me, it's getting people at their local boxing gym, at the local boxing club, taking part in the best board in the world. And people have seen that LGBTQ plus people can compete alongside our allies and that we start seeing more people coming through to the professional ranks and going to the Commonwealth Games, Olympic Games, becoming world boxing champions. But we can stop having these conversations. I don't need to talk about homophobia in sport anymore. Those stats I shared, they're starting to drop, that they're, they're being reversed. I've said by 10 years time, the reason I set up this organization, I want to no longer exist. I don't want to be talking about the need for a competition for people to feel safe. I want people to talk about a competition where people feel welcome, accepted and just go along. Mate, I really love how you've brought that back again, what you mentioned at the top of the show around your purpose, you know, disrupting yeah. that environment, fantastic messaging. What about, let's get selfish because you, you're a fantastic leader, absolutely have no doubt because everything you talk about is is changing others and, and you're driving that, but you're doing that selflessly and that's that courage driving yeah. through. You're using this tag, gay boxing champion. Yeah. Let's get selfish. Are you going to be gay boxing champion in 2023 at the end of that tournament? No, because I'm not competing. <laughs> oh, what? <laughs> Martin, you're all talking no action. Absolutely so. <laughs> let me – I changed my Instagram hag, tag a couple of years. I just put gay boxing champ. I, I love that title. Uh, one of the reasons I'm not competing is because I have so much to organize and – I'm probably going to be the promoter, the games director. So for me personally, it's going to be a lot to get done. It didn't take long for me to realize that the, the purpose is really what is my passion for doing this. So I want to make that happen and lead that change. Now I may spar at the event, but do you see the president of the WBC not boxing, do you see the present, the, they're involved in the sport, they're, they're immersed in the sport. So I may compete in a future World Gay Boxing, but the first one is in Sydney. My job is, is to make this happen. And you know what? I'm still the undefeated gay boxing champion in the world. <laughs> <laughs> and do you know what? I reckon you've got a, a much better title, which is World Change Leader. <laughs> How about you use that one? That world Change Leader. That's definitely where you're at. <laughs> World leader of change, Absolutely. Martin Stark, <laughs> brother of of uh, what's it Stark? What's the Iron Man again? I think Tony's my uncle because he's worth Tony, nine billion right, yeah. dollars. So you know he's uh, he's probably joining Jeff Bezos and Tesla up in and going up to space so they can invite me next time. <laughs> Mate, there is, there is a slight resemblance. I reckon you must be somewhere somewhere related to Tony Stark, surely. <laughs> I wish, I wish. Just even if I had a couple <laughs> million dollars, that would be good. I've never watched Iron Man. And I've never watched Game of Thrones. <laughs> I haven't watched Game of Thrones, but I love the Marvel yeah. series. They're certainly good fun. A family favourite, I have to say. Martin, I always like to ask my guests a sort of penultimate question, I suppose, and that is, What's had the greatest impact on your own leadership journey? The belief in myself to go and lead rather than being led through being in a career. So when I started the World Gay Boxing Championships, it was just me and my vision. It was just me doing that. When I first started posting content on LinkedIn and writing articles, it was just my own thought leadership and knowledge it wasn't waiting for permission or asking for an opportunity. I just started doing it. So I remember leading commercial, remember the, the biggest commercial negotiation I did was a $300 million outsourcing contract. 
and just made it happen. So I knew I was able to do this and just connecting with other leaders outside of the, the bubble of working in procurement, working in corporate, when you leave one environment and you go to another work environment, you need to establish relationships all over again. But when you network, when you grow, when you share your message and you have the confidence to share what you believe, I believe you're in a better place to make a stronger impact than just being part of a system where you can share your view. If you lead, lead with purpose, lead with your own integrity. This is what you stand for. You're being vulnerable and other people will see that and will probably have more trust in you because if you're not sharing who you are, you're hiding who you are in some form. Martin Stark, I don't care what your sexuality is. You are an inspiring human and I really look forward to watching your journey uh, and continuing to be connected as a result of our conversation. I, I appreciate your vulnerability and sharing your experiences and helping me and hopefully helping the Culture of Things community better understand and how we can continue to um, all be looked at as humans rather than labels. Mate, I appreciate your time very, very much and I appreciate you. Thanks for being a guest on the Culture of Things podcast. No, you're welcome and, and thank you for your allyship for that visit. Absolute pleasure, buddy. Do you see Martin as a gay white man championing a cause? Or do you see Martin as an inspiring human? Maybe both. Whichever way you see him, he's a man on a mission to disrupt homophobia, transphobia and hatred in sport. And here's some information on why this inspiring human's work is important. 80% of people in Australia have either witnessed or experienced homophobia in sport. LGBTQI plus people are five times more likely to attempt suicide. Transgender people aged 18 and over are nearly 11 times more likely. 91% of female rugby players said most people assume they're lesbians. LGBTQI plus people can feel insecure and sometimes discriminated against, preventing them from actively participating in sport. Martin's building a solid team and group of allies to help change these stats. Will you make a deliberate decision to be part of the solution, not part of the problem? These were my three key takeaways from my conversation with Martin. My first key takeaway, leaders lead with courage and action. All change starts with one thing, a courageous person to lead it and take action. Martin's the courageous person leading change and taking action. No virtue signaling here, He's gathering the LGBTQI plus community and its allies through the magic of sport. And if you check out the World Gay Boxing Championships website, you'll see he's working to a deadline. Real courage, real action, real leadership. My second key takeaway, leaders are selfless. After recording, Martin shared the other reason he wasn't competing in the World Gay Boxing Tournament. He didn't want to take away from the credibility and purpose of the tournament. It's an unfortunate fact that some people would say it was rigged or it's a setup if he was the tournament CEO and he also happened to win. I saw it in him when he told me he would love to be competing, but like a true leader, he's being selfless and putting the team and cause first. My third key takeaway, leaders lead with a vision. Martin's very clear on why his organisation exists. It exists to disrupt homophobia, transphobia and hatred in sport. This is the beacon which drives them every day. It's a key checkpoint that helps guide their decisions. A vision is part of the filtering process, deciding between all opportunities and the right opportunities. The best leaders know it and therefore lead with a vision. So in summary, my three key takeaways were Leaders lead with courage and action. Leaders are selfless. And leaders lead with a vision. If you want to talk culture, leadership or teamwork, or have any questions or feedback about the episode, you can leave me a comment on the socials or leave me a voice message at thecultureofthings.com. Thanks for joining me. And remember, the best outcome is on the other side of a genuine conversation. <laughs>